Folks, this is Tom Oprey, your host to the podcast where we ask the tough questions regarding man's impact on the world's wildlife. Raw and unfiltered, we strive to help you fully understand the real issues at hand. Our goal, ensuring the world's wildlife and wildlife habitat exists forever. Stay tuned for another edition of Shepherds of the Wild. Marco, uh, thank you so much for being here. Could you give me a little bit about your background as far as your research, papers published, um, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, kind of give me a synopsis, uh, if you will. Um, You know, if someone asks you, you know, who are you? I'm a professor of ecology at the University of Sherbrooke in uh, Sherbrooke, Quebec. I've been working on uh, mountain ungulates for uh, about 40 years now, mostly with bighorn sheep and mountain goats. I've also done some work on alpine ipex, alpine chamois. I've been involved with work with uh, caribou, uh, wolves, and uh, for the last 12 years I've been working on kangaroos. Uh, And nearly all of these research projects are based on monitoring marking individuals. So what I do is catch the animal, put something, tags, collars that allows me to recognize it, Ideally, I catch it as a juvenile, so I know who his mother is. And then with uh, tissue sample DNA testing, we can identify who the father is, so I develop a pedigree. And then I just see what happens to the animal for the rest of its life. Uh, when does it reproduce? When does it die? How much does it grow? How much do the horns grow? How would the weight changes? And we do that for a whole population for a number of years. You get a very good uh, set of data that tells you about the reproductive success of these animals, about the reproductive strategy, and also in terms of population dynamics. Uh, when numbers go up, when numbers go down, what's driving those changes? Sheep, bighorn sheep is obviously a big component of the research you've done, uh, especially you know, bighorns in Alberta. Um, I mean, that, you know, what is kind of the history of these bighorn sheep as far as where they've been prior to release and and modern management of them. You know, where are they today? Unlike in much of uh, the sudden distribution of bighorn sheep, uh, bighorn sheep in Alberta were not as affected by uh, the diseases that have caused the extirpation of many of the sheep herds uh, in the States and also in uh, parts of British Columbia. So the this current distribution of bighorn sheep in Alberta is very similar to what would have been the historic, or let's say the distribution of bighorn sheep in Alberta when uh, European colonizers or European invaders uh, first came in. Uh, there was some market hunting early in the century. Uh, obviously, the southern part of the province, there is a bit of an history of domestic sheep farming, so there were some, uh, some diseases. And uh, like many other big game species in the early 1900, people started thinking, well, maybe we need to set some kind of a hunting limit. I think the initial season, there was a limit of six. And then it went to, well, you can only shoot males. And uh, I think it was in about the early 60s when uh, people brought in this definition of minimum curl. Up to that point, a person could buy a license and he could shoot a male. Because there was an unlimited number of licenses, most hunters were actually shooting yearlings and two-year-olds, because that's about all that was available outside uh, the national parks. About 19, I believe it was about 1963, they brought in a three-quarter curl legislation, which was then extended to a four-fifths of a curl. So for about the last 35, 40 years, the management of bighorn sheep outside the national parks in Alberta has been an unlimited number of permits for residents. There is also about 40 outfitters that can take uh, no resident clients, and obviously there's a huge difference in the in the cost. And uh, the punt has been managed by this uh, idea that a horn curl limit would allow, well, would essentially protect young rams. Uh, at the same time, uh, beginning uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, there's been a limited uh, number of permits available for uh, use. And the history of the ewe hunt uh, is kind of interesting because initially it was brought in because of a concern that high population density may favor the spread of pneumonia. Uh, we talk a lot about trophy hunting and horn size and potential evolutionary impacts of uh, the hunt, but the, big horn, the problem for bighorn sheep conservation in North America is disease, pneumonia from domestic sheep. So the initial idea for the U permits uh, was uh, let's keep density below carrying capacity that may decrease uh, the chance of a disease. On the reasonable assumption that if you have high density you have 
animals that are in poor condition, more susceptible to disease. Now we know that it actually makes very, very little difference. What you need to do to avoid disease, avoid contact with uh, domestic sheep. Uh, so it's only been uh, fairly recently that uh, we started thinking about well, what are the potential evolutionary consequences of having a situation where whether the ram lives or dies is determined by horn size. And more importantly, by the fact that if the horns grow quickly, the ram's gonna attain that definition of legal, you know, a hunter can legally shoot it at a younger age. Given that now we know that horns affect reproductive success mostly on mature rams, say seven, eight years old and older, uh, we've created this situation where a young ram with rapidly growing horns will hit the negative selecting pressure potential of getting shot by a hunter, two or three years before those big horns will allow him high reproductive success. So in one uh, isolated population where uh, people have been marking sheep for uh, many years, and in fact the study of that population was started to see what kind of use season can we tolerate, what is the sustainable yield for uh, use, what happens to the orphan lambs, and so the program was started on marking individuals, then I uh, essentially took over the, uh, the research uh, beginning about 1990-1991 and uh, the project had been run by Alberta Fish and Wildlife before and uh, so I was very lucky to inherit this long-term database which of course I then continued for another 30 years and through the use of a pedigree we were able to demonstrate that uh, yes uh, selective hunting has led to the evolution of smaller horns. So now that is a concern because people are interested in the evolutionary sustainability of the hunt and biologists in Alberta propose to change the regulation to try and lower uh, that selective pressure. What is really important to understand is that with an unlimited number of permits, the selective pressure on legal ram is extremely high. So what we see from the Ram Mountain uh, case is about 40% harvest of legal ram every year, which means if you're legal at four, your chance of making it to rat as a seven-year-old is about 6%. It's about 10 times lower than um, if you don't become legal until you're, uh, you're eight. And we've seen a decrease in the harvest over the, um, the province, partly because the four and five-year-old, which say 20, 25 years ago, were making up a third, uh, a quarter to a third of the harvest, now they make up less than 10%. And the reason why they make up such a low uh, proportion of your harvest is that very, very few rams of that age now are legal to hunt because the horn growth has uh, declined. So you have a direct correlation to horn size and the continued evolution of this animal. So because of the targeting of these older, larger, uh, I mean the largest animals within that population, what are you seeing is that these animals overall aren't growing as large? I mean, does any of that have to do with survivability of the species or does that have any effect at all? No, uh, well, first of all, one, the really important issue here is that the rams that are getting shot are not the older rams, are the rams that become legal at a younger age. So a lot of this is four, five and six year old. Uh, if this was continued over the long term, we have some evidence from genetic correlation that this may have uh, some population demographic consequences because uh, there are other aspects of fitness that are correlated with the large horn size. But these correlations are reasonably weak and I certainly cannot say that we've seen an impact at the population level. So at this point, it's really, I would say it's really mostly a social issue. Uh, do we want to have a hunt that is evolutionally sustainable? Uh, you know, I see a lot of value in uh, hunting. I think uh, sheep hunters are uh, very important defenders of sheep as a component of the biodiversity, their habitat, uh, preventing uh, the spread of disease, etc. And there certainly are people that are very, very interested in maintaining sheep in the mountain. At the same time, sport hunting management is supposed to be sustainable and at this point it clearly is not evolutionally sustainable we're forcing a change in the uh, in the size of the horns through uh, the hunt uh, so no I, I wouldn't say that i would expect you know a heightened risk of extinction i just personally don't think it's right to manage a species in a way that induces a more uh, an evolutionary change that is due to the to the hunt but even though this has been somewhat controversial, I like to underline is far from being 
you know, the big issue for Bighorn sheep management, for Bighorn sheep conservation, the big issue is disease. So looking at, at what the issues are that you're studying, how should we manage the mountain ungulates like the Rocky Mountain Bighorn? We know exactly how to do it, uh, and we know how to do it to avoid this evolutionary change, and uh, the harvest needs to be lowered. Uh, either a much lower level of harvest or a harvest that does not target rapidly growing grams when they're four or five. And we have a very good example of that happening, for example, in many of the jurisdictions in the states where there is quotas, there's a much shorter hunting season, and it's very easy to tell if you're successful or not. All you have to do is look at the age of the rams that are being harvested. So in many of the states, most of the rams that are shot are eight, nine, ten years of age. That means that most of those rams survived to at least one, two ruts where they were able to breed and propagate their genes. If, like the situation in Alberta, these rapidly growing rams with rapidly growing horns get shot when they're four, five, and six, it means that they be taken out of the population before they've had an opportunity to breed, and that's when you get evolution of small horns. So um, we know how to fix it. The drawback is that inevitably that would require a lower harvest. Uh, we could maintain the same harvest if we said, okay, everybody just shoots half curls. So there's no selection. They, we take young rams and we can take quite a few because we take them when they're younger. So uh, they, um, there's more of them because they haven't gone through the natural mortality. But we do that independently of horn size. Bighorn sheep is generally considered a trophy species. What people want is the big trophy. And so there's a bit of a social component that uh, that's how a lot of people see bighorn sheep hunting. If we could get rid of that, and people appreciate a bighorn sheep hunting because of sheep hunting, not because you know the horns of my ram are bigger than yours, uh, then we could look at an alternative. But right now, it's managed as a trophy species, and we know how to manage it as a trophy species. We need to direct the harvest. Uh, I'm certainly not saying to the old rams, like the very old rams, 10 and 12 years old, but at least let them breed for at least one or two ruts. So. Uh, if you saw it like it is in some, uh, uh, for example, in the Northwest Territories in Canada, most of the old sheep ram that are shot at 10 years and older, it's probably not causing a problem. But in Alberta, um, there's so much more hunting opportunity than there is, let's say, let's, let's say the States, because the access uh, to draw is very, very limited here. How does that compare to Alberta? where you can buy a sheep hunting license every two years over the counter. Now that's an Alberta residence, but every two years, a resident can buy a license and hunt in Alberta. No, you can buy it every year. Okay. You have to skip it. If you are successful, then you cannot buy a license the following year. So until you shoot a sheep, you can buy a license every year. The consequence of that is that currently the success rate for trophy sheep is about 4%. So less than one person in 20 who buys a license will actually harvest the sheep. And much of that low success rate is because uh, there's very few legal rams. And uh, we're seeing a decrease in the number of legal rams. And if you look at a pattern of when sheep are getting shot, there's a big peak, essentially in the first two days of the hunt. And so that's when the new crop of legal ram gets taken out of the population, and then it goes down uh, so this would be late, late August, or early September, depending on the region in Alberta. And then it goes down to almost nothing because people start hunting deer and uh, moose and other things. And then at the very end of the season, you see this other peak, not in the whole province, but in most of it. And in fact, in the central part of the province, this peak in the last week of October is higher than the peak early uh, at the opening of the season. And we have very strong evidence that a substantial part of that second peak its rams are coming out of national parks. So the age goes up, uh, the average age of the rams that are shot goes up at the very end of uh, October, which fits with the idea of these rams from the national park moving around, starting to look for breeding opportunities. And accounting for age, those rams that are shot late in the season are slightly, they've got slightly bigger horns than the ones that were shot earlier on near the park. Uh, the difference is not huge, about one, one and a half centimeter. But again, it suggests rams that are coming out of a population that is not subjected to the same level of selective pressure. So they've not evolved the smaller horns because overall the hunting pressure for population inside the park is less than for population uh, outside the park. 
One potential solution to this would be to go like in many of the states, a quota. So it's a draw or whatever. That would be very difficult to implement uh, in Alberta because of the tradition that people have that you know, being able to buy a permit and go sheep hunting. So one alternative solution that would avoid a quota would be to raise uh, the level of, uh, say, go from four-fifths of a curl to full curl. And what our data indicate is that if we went to full curl, the age at which rams are getting shot will go up by about one and a half to two years. Uh, that would still involve some substantial selective hunting, but some of these big rams and big horns will get an opportunity to breed before they get killed. So presumably the selective pressure will be, uh, will be lower. So it's a matter of balancing, you know, the best solution from the management point to completely avoid uh, artificial uh, selection. But you have to take into account the social aspect and you don't want to lose the support for, I say sheep conservation, but I'm really talking about mountain habitat conservation that comes from sheep hunters, which again are one of the groups that are more likely, you know, to go to the barricade to defend mountain habitat, uh, preventing disease transmission, and really defending mountain biodiversity. That's great. Now, if I understand you correctly, it's the difference between horn size of, say, four-fifths to a full curl that may be the deciding factor between the evolutionary progress or change. I mean, it's, uh, it's a matter of the management changing to the larger animal or older animal to elevate those evolutionary concerns? Yes, that's full curl would be better than four fish. So for example, in British Columbia, just on the other side of the Rockies, Rocky Mountain Bacon Sheep are managed under a full curl uh, regulation. And at least the last time we looked at this, excuse me, which was about 10 years ago, we could not find evidence of uh, evolution decline in horn size on that side of the Rockies. So, I don't know whether full curl will fix it, but certainly will make it uh, better. Like I said, by adding uh, some uh, some life expectancy uh, to the rams. The other thing that happens with full curls is that uh, more large horned rams will not be legal because when they fight, they smash into each other and they break their horn. So the definition is based on this morphological characteristic. If the horn breaks, the ram becomes illegal. So there would be a lower harvest, more rams will survive to uh, older age, uh, clearly success rate will go down, uh, but you would still have a situation where everybody who's a resident can buy a license and go sheep hunting. The other management strategy that would probably lower the evolutionary impact would be to close the season 10 days earlier. Because at that point you allow these non-selected rams that are coming out of the protected area, mostly national parks, to come out and do what we can refer to as a genetic rescue. So there would be dominant rams because you can imagine a ram from a national park who's maybe number three or four in the social hierarchy in his home herd, goes out into the provincial land where most of his competitors have been shot, he's number one. So he's probably gonna have a very high reproductive success and propagate genes that have not been selected uh, by the trophy hunt. And that would allow, would certainly weaken uh, the selective pressure. Right now, that is not happening to a large extent because these rams start moving at the end of October. When they get out into the provincial land, they get shot. In fact, in the northern part of the province, where there isn't a second peak at the end of the season, we are seeing a much uh, shallower decline in horn size, which could be due to effective genetic rescue from uh, the national parks. Now, as I understand it in Alberta, residents have a longer hunting season than non-resident hunters. Uh, in November, residents can hunt. Uh, I think they start in August, whereas uh, non-residents can't start till October 15th. But uh, getting into November, we are now getting into the breeding season. How much of an impact would come from shortening the season for, you know, for its, its resident hunters? Or, you know, is there a kind of magical time period where, ha you know, we're having, I understand, having these other rams that come out of other areas like Banff or other national parks get into the gene pool and start breeding. But, you know, moving the season back, are you running into social economic issues that are causing this not to happen? Because to me, it makes perfect sense. Well, the social economic issue is the hunters know that that's when you get your sheep. So, again, there is no solution to lowering the artificial pressure while maintaining a trophy hunt that does not involve reducing the harvest. Uh, like I said, if we get rid of the trophy idea and we said, okay guys, you shoot two-year-olds, 
you could probably increase the number of rams that are shot. That's not what people want. Uh, that is one of the issues that uh, right now resident hunters are allowed to hunt until uh, the end of October, while the outfitters are limited. Like you said, I think it closes, I forget what it's, 10 days or two weeks earlier. Uh, so if you close the hunt sooner, it would certainly limit hunting opportunities. But it would still allow people to buy a sheep tag and go hunting until the middle of uh, October. And uh, again, the reason for avoiding the end of October is that's when the rams are moving around. And you can see that this peak in the harvest happens only close to the parks. If you go in the area further away from the parks, at the end of the season, there is a very shallow or, or no peak uh, at all. The November hunt, unfortunately, is an additional problem that has been brought in in recent years because for multiple reasons there are some areas where and that it's on a draw uh, there's a limited number of tags for hunting in november essentially during the rut and what we've seen in recent years is that the proportion of the overall harvest that is in those special permits has been going up uh, so the overall decline in the harvest that we see globally would probably be much greater if it wasn't for those November uh, permits. And I see that as a particular problematic issue because, again, in that case, it's mostly near the national park. They're probably taking rams that, you know, how is a ram available in November that was not available during the regular hunting season in October? Well, it's probably coming from somewhere else. And so they're coming out of the, out of the protected area and it's contributing to that, to eliminating this potential dampening of the uh, evolutionary pre uh, pressure that would happen if park rams were allowed to, uh, uh, were allowed to breed. Uh, and the other change that we're seeing is that the decline in the harvest is mostly in the southern part of the province, in the southern two-thirds of the sheep hunting uh, areas, which is the area which are the areas where we see the second peak at the end of the season. The northern units or Academy North uh, the number of rams that are getting shot hasn't really decreased over the last 25, 30 years. The substantial decrease has been in the south. What is different between the north and the south? In the north, uh, there has been overall an increase in uh, population size in over a period of about 30 years, which may mean more rams are available, but also, uh, with the exception of uh, the Cadomin area, we don't see the second peak uh, at the end of the season, so it could be that some of it is due to the fact that there is some evolution in rescue. That's great. You obviously have studied lots of different animal species in your career. In this day and age, with social media, the access to information is infinite. There's no checks, there's no balances, there's no, there's no kind of stuff. I mean, it's, you know, we see a large portion of our population completely disconnected from nature. Sustainable utilization in the North American model does have some benefits in that it has been very successful in bringing wildlife species back from, you know, I call it the European steamroller or European invasion. Um, but uh, what do you see as the future of wildlife conservation in that North American model with today's society in that information age? It has to be science-based and we have to find a way to communicate. You mentioned there is information, there's availability of information, there's also a great availability to misinformation. Uh, my own research has been instrumentalized by anti-hunting, anti-use group to say uh, any kind of trophy hunting will lead to uh, artificial evolution of smaller horns and will lead to population extinction, which is clearly not what my research uh, says, is not what any kind of research says, but it can be used to propagate campaigns of misinformation. I mean, there, there's merchants of doubt on both sides. Uh, so that is certainly uh, an issue, and that is why the hunting community really needs to be driven and show to be driven by, uh, by science, by real knowledge. So maybe the consequences of this artificial selection and the evolution of smaller horn is simply, well, the rams are smaller horn, there are fewer opportunities for hunting. But in a world of social media, in a world where hunting is under much more scrutiny, I think it's to the detriment of the hunting community to knowingly pursue a strategy that is causing an artificial change in the morphology of the animal. The other point that I could not emphasize more in this age of social media, stop putting pictures of that animal on the internet. That is, I spent I spent a lot of time, uh, I was in the IUCN, I am still in the IUCN Sustainable Use Group, 
in the IUCN Caprina Specialist Group, we really did a lot to use the idea of conservation hunting, and we see several examples in this conference, for conservation of mountain uh, biodiversity. To say there are ways of directing this huge potential economic gain towards habitat protection, disease mitigation, uh, making local people realize, hey, I got a value from live sheep, not, uh, you know, much greater value on the live sheep than on the meat that I can get uh, from killing one or from having the habitat overgrazed by my livestock. You can do it until you're blue in the face. Somebody puts a video of, I paid $110,000 and I shot this big marker and here it is covered in blood, you're screwed. Uh, you know, we all seen Cecil the Lion, it's only one of the examples. Uh, British Columbia, a couple of years ago, shut down the grizzly bear hunt not based on science. And things like, you know, a video on social media of this idiot shooting at this grizzly bear and laughing about it, well, uh, it's disgusting. I mean, I find that sort of thing repellent and inevitably people react just like you would expect to react and uh, that's one thing that I really don't like about trophy hunting you know it's all based on mine is bigger than yours and people like to look I shot this big sheep yeah and now thousands of people are gonna see it and think you're an idiot how could the hunting industry better portray trophies being more along the lines of this is about conservation because some guy wins an award for all these animals that he's collected. I mean, the man or woman has spent a lot of money hunting, creating a lot of value, sometimes in very remote countries, or even here in North America. What is your advice to the hunting community moving forward? Well, see, if that award was seen as I'm compensating somebody who's contributed a lot to conservation, that would be great. But the way it's seen, I'm compensating somebody for having killed a bunch of animals. And that, again, in the age of social media, doesn't go down very well. Uh, and I think the hunting community is making strides, for example, in trying to tell you know, the members of groups like the Wild Sheep Foundation, the social media thing is a problem. Don't post uh, the pictures. And trying, there's many people, I'm talking about the Wild Sheep Foundation, but there's also many other hunting organizations who are really working hard to say, let's get away from this hornography that, you know, it's not the size of what you shot that it's important, is the experience, the contribution to conservation, uh, the being out in nature, the knowing about the animals, and it's a great hunt even if you don't get anything. But on the other side, there is a large number of people who are making money out of telling, convincing people that, you know, what you want is a big buck. So here's some special feed. Uh, here, if you come and you know, in my guiding territory, there is a guarantee that you get this uh, animal with larger uh, antlers. Um, and so there is economic pressure on the other side that is pushing this sort of, you know, this is a competition. Uh, so I think what the hunting community should do, what many leaders in the hunting community are doing, to say, it's a hunt. It's not a game. It's not how big your animal is. It's the whole experience of the hunt and emphasizing, you know, we're putting money to habitat protection, uh, we have very strict regulations, and uh, as a community, we are the ones that are agitating for, you know, better endangered species legislation, protection of the habitat, lower access, all the things that maintain biodiversity. So the last question, oh, has to do with politicization of wildlife conservation. Uh, here with the North American model, um, you know, let's go, you know, we're talking about what in Canada, say British Columbia. Uh, we've also seen it uh, in New Jersey with black bears, uh, where in the governor's race, the politicians uh, chose to, to add to their platform uh, to ban a specific type or method of hunting. Uh, in the case of New Jersey, obviously, it was hunting of black bears. How does this affect wildlife conservation moving forward? And can we truly manage wildlife and habitat ecosystems if we don't have all the tools at our disposal to be good wildlife managers? Within a North American context, um, to me, the major negative consequence of these changes is we are losing the hunting community and so we're losing a group of people that are really strongly in favor of uh, conservation. Uh, it's very different in African and other contexts where really either you have the trophy hunt or you have overgrazing and you lose uh, uh, the wildlife uh, the wildlife species. Uh, 
it's a very difficult one because of the ease in social media to you know propagate these uh, misconceptions um, on the uh, on the other hand there is needs to be a change in uh, in behavior on the part of the the hunting community especially with regarding to trof trophy hunt trophy hunting because I think every single poll shows that maybe a slight majority or a, often a minority of people who don't hunt may have a negative view of hunting but if you mention trophy hunting the level of negativity escalates uh, they really don't like this idea of you know uh, a person hunting killing an animal just to get a, uh, a big set of horns uh, we've seen an evolution in uh, in the way the regulation are set up and inevitably they have to take into account uh, what we may refer to as a social license and so for example right now there's a lot of opposition to hunting any kind of predator and uh, that may have to be taken into account uh, well if the public really does not you know this was the case for example with the British Columbia grizzly bear hunt that it was essentially driven by a apparent desire of the public on not seeing uh, large predators being hunted. Now you're moving that, you're seeing the same pressure coming up for things like bobcat and, and, uh, and cougar. I never seen management as a way to improve on nature. I think we can tolerate a sustainable uh, harvest and we use management to limit uh, our impact. There are many cases now, for example, in places where there are no predators, in which I think we need to harvest uh, some population of herbivores because otherwise we'd have um, overpopulation, which leads, for example, as is the case of white-tailed deer, loss of some plant species, some bird species, etc. But I also don't see that, uh, you know, ecosystems got along quite well on their own before wildlife managers were evol uh, evolved. Uh, so it, it's a very complex issue and it kind of depends on how you want to look at. But to me, again, the main issue here is that we need to maintain a group of people that are going to be out there fighting in favor of you know protecting habitat not polluting a river uh, doing something about climate change and realizing that you know we depend on ecosystem services so what do you think is the greatest threat to wildlife in the future or in areas where they live today uh, land use change and then climate change uh, first land use change which is directly related to increase in human population and on the footprint of individual humans. So uh, not just there's more people, but also they're consuming more. Uh, and that is by far the greatest uh, threat worldwide. On top of that and compounding it, there's obviously the issue of climate change, which is to some extent having the same effect that uh, habitat is, uh, is disappearing. But those two issues combine, and I would certainly say first, land use uh, change. So actually conversion to agriculture, cutting down forests, burning the forest uh, is, is by far, uh, you know, and pollution goes into that, dumping plastic in the ocean, dumping uh, other pollution is another form of, you know, land use uh, change. Thanks for listening. You can find this podcast wherever great podcasts live, including on the Shepherds of Wildlife Society website at shepherdsofwildlife.org. Please tell a friend and let's save wildlife together.